Okay, very good. The YouTube is now running. So for everybody to be aware that we are currently live on YouTube. And also just a quick housekeeping reminder to when you'd like to speak, please do say your name and pause and wave a little bit before proceeding. It helps our interpreting team see you and recognize that you're speaking. And you're invited in the introductions and in your Zoom name to share um, your pronouns as part of the introductions. And Angelo, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Angelo. I am the chair of this commission. I'm for board two, and my pronouns are he, him. And uh, we can do introductions just like popcorn style. So I'll turn it to uh, Mike. I should have known you always go to me. Uh, Mike, uh, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a resident of Ward 7. And I will pass it to Krista, as is my custom. Thanks. This is Krista. Um, and I, last name is Gallagher. And I am the vice chair. And I am from Ward 4. Oh, and I'm going to go to David. Hi, my name is David Reinholdt. Um, I'm a resident of Polk County, and my pronouns are he and him. And I'm going to go to Drew. Hi, my name is Drew. I'm a resident of Ward 3, and I use the he, him pronouns, and we'll go to Tricarico. Hi, I'm Tricarico. I'm a resident of Ward 2. I use they, them pronouns, and I'll go to Alex. Hi, I'm Alex, resident of Ward 2. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I will pass it on to Bella. Hi, I'm Bella. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a resident of Ward 6. Is that right, Gretchen? Or 4? I don't remember. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and I will pass it on to Renee. Hello. This is Renee. I am a resident of Ward 8, and I use she, her pronouns. And I will pass it on to Kathy. On my video. Hi, my name is Kathy. I live in South Salem, and I'm here as a guest again tonight. Thanks. I will pass it on to um, Sandy. Hi, I'm one of the sign language interpreters. <laughs> I'll pass it on to, um, I'm not sure who would be next, actually. <laughs> I'm just, I'm one of the interpreters. Okay, my voice is in, but my picture isn't. This is Lee. <laughs> Welcome, Lee, we're glad you're here. And let's see, Linnell, do you wanna say hello? Hello. <laughs> Buenos dias, mi amigos y amigas. <laughs> También. Welcome, Lee. Thank <laughs> you. Welcome, okay. Linnell. My name is Linnell, and I'm a guest and a homeless advocate and a program manager at Safe Sleep Women's sh um, Shelter, Homeless Shelter. And let's see, Dr. Brown, have you introduced yourself yet? Uh, not yet. Hello everyone, I live in Ward 5 and I also am a guest and my pronouns are he and him. Thank you. What about you, Krista? Have you said hi yet? Yes, I did. I already did it. Yep. Hi, Krista. Did we miss anybody? Do you want me to introduce myself, Gretchen, yes, now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Debbie Aguilar, Lieutenant with Salem Police, and I'm the liaison between the Salem Police Department and the Human Rights Commission, and my pronouns are she, her. And I think that's everybody. So, Gretchen, back to you. Very good. Gretchen, staff to the commission from the city manager's office, she, her, and Angelo, I turn it to you. 
All right, we can move on to a uh, public comment. If anybody has uh, anything they want to say, I think we limited it to three minutes. So, Gretchen, does anybody have public comment today? Maybe I, I want to remind both Linnell and Lee that we actually have agenda items for them under agenda number four. So, if if they also have public comment, that's welcome. But we do have you on the agenda, and then any of our guests including Linnell and Lee are welcome to also provide public comment if they like. Okay. All right, it doesn't sound like we have any today and I did not receive any via email. Mm -hmm. All right, it sounds good. So we can move on to agenda number two. Item number three, the consent calendar, approval of agenda and approval of minutes. And then whenever you're ready, somebody can uh, for mo do a motion to approve those. This is Drew, I make a mo motion to approve the agenda and the minutes as, of, as presented. This is Bella. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bella. Oh, I said this is Bella. I second. All right, that is. Uh... Oh wait, oh yeah, we have to vote. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> aye. I think I heard no opposition. Is that correct? Great. All right, we can move on to uh, number four, action and or dis discussion items. And then our first one is input suggestions, uh, Linnell. And I can welcome Linnell briefly. You might remember Linnell Wilcox um, and also from our introduction, Linnell was um, the person who shared the student survey um, with um, people in our community who are unsheltered neighbors to help capture that input. And she had some thoughts and wanted to share some information about um, receiving input this evening. And we've got 10 minutes on the agenda for this topic. So I'm gonna, um, I know you have a lot on your agenda, so I'm gonna try to keep time. And then of course, if commissioners have questions, um, that can also occur as well. And so Linnell, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on your agenda. Um, so as I said, I work and I volunteer with people who are homeless very often. And I was so happy to see that the city was doing a discrimination survey because I'm hearing stories almost every day about the discrimination individuals who are homeless are experiencing. Um, and just an example of the kinds of things people are telling me are that people won't talk to them, won't look at them. They're sometimes asked to leave stores before there's even any indication about whether the person is going to be a customer. Um, they're not allowed to use restrooms even when they're pay a paying customer sometimes. Um, they have people yell at them to get a job without knowing any of their story or situation or if, even if they already have a job. I've had men who are in tears as they tell me that they've woken up to being peed on, spit on, yelled at, and they can't talk about it because it's too humiliating to say more. So these are the kinds of stories I'm hearing almost every day. So I was so happy to see that a survey was happening so that these individuals could have a voice and share about the discrimination they're experiencing. And um, I was extra grateful to Gretchen because a lot of this, it seemed like the survey was mostly online and that was really inaccessible to most of the individuals who are in this population and many individuals who are also just experiencing extreme poverty and not necessarily homelessness. Um, so Gretchen printed out a hundred surveys in print for me and um, we took them to the streets. We talked to people at HOPE, which is um, Homeless Outreach Advocacy Project, ARCHES, UGM, Union Gospel Mission, and to individuals that had started to live under Rite Aid and Nordstrom and downtown awnings. And um, so just the aspect that it was really inaccessible to some of the people who are most marginalized and most likely to be discriminated against was something that I noticed. Um, and then 
the tight time frame, and I know that was partly Western Oregon University's time frame that you guys were trying, you know, needing to stick to. But when you're going out in the field to get input, it's it was I learned a lot. Um, and we were happy to have the opportunity to go talk to people, but certain things that are just part of the landscape of being homeless are things that even I can forget even in doing this work. You don't have time and interest to do a survey when you're living in survival mode. When you're trying to figure out where you're gonna sleep safely tonight, where's your next meal gonna be? How are you gonna to get to and from your appointments without losing your stuff or having it stolen or having to drag it around? You're just, you're in survival mode. So filling out a survey about discrimination is gonna be extremely hard to do. Um, but I think there's strategies to be able to get to those individuals in a way that could support other things they're doing without going out in the streets and saying, hey, you're in survival mode, um, but here, I have a survey for you. Um, the form, I think it had a lot of um, detail that might be necessary statistically, um, but we were losing audiences before we even got into the questions about discrimination. When you're getting into the definitions and um, some of the details of the questions, I wish maybe they could be at the end instead of the beginning because we were trying to explain the definitions and some of the other details. And in survival mode, you just don't have the time and energy for that. You're exhausted just from surviving. Um, the deadline was, was tight and we were learning that um, even more than I realized, the, the people that were serving very often have cognitive disabilities and illiteracy. And I knew that was a fact, but I didn't know how much it was a fact. I didn't know how many people were experiencing that. So we're literally reading the questions to them, explaining what the question means, and then getting their answer without ans asking anything leading. So we're sticking with the survey format so that we're not trying to lead information, but asking, you know, what has happened to you and then trying to write it down for individuals because many individuals could not read or could not understand at the level of the survey. And yet I feel like underserved populations are gonna be the ones that are most likely to be marginalized and discriminated against. And yet the actual accessibility isn't there for some of the disabilities they experience. Um, overall, we collected, I think 36 surveys um, Google tells me Salem's population is 173,442. We have about 1,800 homeless individuals counted in the last point in time count. So they reflect about 1% of Salem's total population. And 36 surveys reflects about 2% of the homeless total homeless population. So I would hope that we can do better than that. And I feel like it's so good to be asking these questions. And I would love if... Um, we could continue to do this kind of question, but really get ways to have this information be more accurate and more effective so that you have the data that's really gonna make a difference. And um, another detail is that we have a culture that fears homeless people very often and statistics consistently prove that you're more likely to have a sheltered person um, hurt a homeless individual than be hurt by a homeless individual. And it would be wonderful if police statistics could track whether a crime is done by or to a homeless person, because I think that's one other data point that reflects discrimination or lack of discrimination. And I would hope that would be an easy change that could be recommended to the police department, especially as we're considering police policies and procedures and protocols. Um, and I think the, I think one thing that was really compelling to me was that when we were doing the surveys downtown at Rite Aid, I knew I had heard that people are getting yelled at and honked at, but kneeling down with people doing the surveys and having horns blaring, honking, engines revving, the noise pollution itself was incredible. It was so hard to be able to get questions and answers happening because you literally couldn't hear yourself think. And I had heard that was happening, but being on the ground, literally, you know, on the floor, talking to somebody on the sidewalk and asking them questions, the noise pollution was incredible. And to me, that reflects a huge aspect of discrimination. Um, so I have other things I could say, but I think it would be mostly kind of providing details about those points. Um, 
and I don't want to take too much of your time. So if anyone has questions, I would be happy if you guys are going to proceed with this kind of survey. I think it's so valuable, but um, we'd really need to do better inclusiveness and accessibility. And if there were a committee or task force that was trying to work on that, I would be honored to participate and just share ideas. This is Trick Erico. Thank you, Linnell, for sharing that information. Um, the next time that we do this survey, I would love to have you be a part of those conversations um, to share the concerns that you have so we can see how we can adjust to include people. You know, I'm thinking maybe the students that are volunteering, I know in the past have done um, community outreach to get more, you know, in-person surveys. And perhaps part of that can be volunteering to do what you did and sit down with people um, or just finding more people to help you with that so we can reach more people. Uh -huh. um, I don't know when the next survey is coming up, but I would love to have you be a part of that conversation. I think that um, this is an important lesson for the students in accessibility and truly including everyone. So your perspective in that is really valuable and also just a great opportunity for those students to learn about what that looks like and how to do that. Thank you. And um, I think that a, a connected piece of that is that I'm, I'm suspecting the accessibility thing really affects many, many people who are living in poverty, whether they're homeless or not. So this is bigger than just whether someone is homeless. And I think that one strategy would be able, if, if there were significant timeframes, besides having volunteers, students doing outreach, having the surveys available at the, at the service providers that people are going to anyway, then it's not like taking up time from their, they're literally trying to survive from day to day. It's like you're going to a place for some supports and services anyway. And there's a person who is going to walk you through a survey if you choose to share your voice and you're already there. So I think that could be one strategy that really would enable more inclusiveness and accessibility and people kind of walking along and holding hands with somebody as they're completing the survey. Thank you, that's a great idea. I think Krista had something to say. Thanks, Jacarico. I don't know, I, I know that there was a question I had. What is, what are some of the, like, what's the literacy level of the questions on the survey? Wouldn't that be a Gretchen question or a, a student, WOU? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I felt like as I was Please. trying to explain some of the things, it was, I'm reading the definition of discrimination and the definition of discrimination is part of the survey. And that in itself was going over people's heads. I can try to answer a little bit of it. Um, Bella was in the in the class, of course, and may have other insight from more behind the scenes. Um, we did uh, look at the survey from a literacy perspective and um, actually, I think, made some changes between the first survey and this second survey. But uh, I, I would just concur with you, Linnell, that uh, more can be done. Um, the other major gap in the first survey is that we did not have a Spanish version. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the challenges you experienced with the unsheltered population, we also have a large population of non-English speakers in Salem who uh, did not have the opportunity as well. Um, I did want to say um, not in any way to um, to negate or invalidate anything you said, because everything you said is completely valid. But more uh, for additional information, I wanted to say that the survey results from the uh, unsheltered residents were extremely valuable. Okay. Um, because you collected them in a different manner, we were able to separate out those results. We were able to show that people who are experiencing homelessness are having the worst experiences here in Salem than your general population. So although the tool was very imperfect this year and, and I'm terribly sorry that it was not, um, that, it, that we weren't there yet with the tool, I, I did wanna to validate that the work that you did was so valuable um, 
and will feed into what we do at the next survey. Uh, my other hope is that we'll have more lead time with the next survey, um, uh, that we'll be able to jump on it a little earlier. The hard part is that when we're working with the students is we have to follow their semesters. Right. Um, but this time, perhaps we can be just a little more ahead. Um, having done the survey twice, um, my hope is that we can be just, just that much more ahead so that you can have as much time as possible. So thank, thank you for coming, really. And thank you for that input. Um, I, I do believe that 36 would still be useful, but just knowing that so many, and I don't know what technically is a good return or a good percent of a population. So 2% seems really low to me, but I don't know what a desirable is. I'm, I'm just not in a statistical field. Um, it's but. probably a better return on our, because of your work, we had probably had a better return on our unsheltered residents than we did on general population. Okay. So in that sense, uh, you really did very important work by getting us even 36. We know we want to include the sample size of the bigger survey as well. Yeah. And thank you for doing this at all. And um, I would expect that in any project like this, we're all going to have learning curves. And, you know, if, if everybody got it like perfect on the first shot, I'd be amazed. So I, th I think it's just a learning curve and being able to see, even for myself, I was surprised at how much illiteracy we were encountering and how many cognitive disabilities we were encountering and how much mental illness we were encountering. And I already knew that those are prevalent in, in this population, but it was way more prevalent than I expected. So if I was trying to plan a literacy level, I wouldn't have gone much lower until I, actually was in the fields finding out, wow, this is way higher than what most of the people I'm talking to are able to comprehend. And that was a surprise to me. This is Bella. Um, I wanna also echo what Mike said. Thank you so much, Linnell, for the feedback. I think, you know, in, in trying to make the surveys accessible to many people so that we can actually understand what's happening here in Salem. Um, these are really great considerations to take. And I think, you know, because we're in a place where we most likely still have a few months, at least until we're approached by um, the class again, hopefully. Um, you know, this maybe this is something that our awareness committee can work on in terms of you know, really solidifying what are the key concerns. And because I was a part of the class, um, I do recall what our last term, um, what, what the last term required. And so, uh, yeah, I'm happy to work with the uh, awareness committee to bring your concerns and you know, other concerns and things to look for for the next one. Thank you so much. And I, I think it connects to also police tracking that data and it, it might connect to um, just being able to have more awareness of how prevalent some misperceptions are and that can help plan better collaborations with partners who might be able to help collect the data. And thank you so much. You bet, Linnell, I'd be happy to follow up on um, Commissioner Schwartz Tricarico's suggestion about having you at a meeting and let you know if you're interested in that when those, meet, when those subcommittee meetings are. Thank you all for doing this. I think it's so valuable that you're, you're going in this direction. And, and maybe it even feeds into whether homelessness should be a protected class, depending on how the discrimination plays out. I'm very grateful, thank you. All right. Thank you, Linnell. I appreciate your work and your time, uh, all the time you put into this important work. All right, we have been suggestions. What is this uh, Lee's time or it how is, is this work? Um, it is, um, you may, some of you may remember Lee. Lee has spoken with us at previous meetings and his community mm -hmm. involvement includes the local United Nations chapter and other organizations. And Lee asked to be able to talk tonight about some event ideas. 
And Lee, I'm this I'm again, ready. we also had 10 minutes available. So I'm I've got a I'm gonna set a timer. Good. Okay. I'll try not to overtook. Okay. Shall I start now? Yes, sir. Okay. Our theme is community healing. Background, October 24th, 1945. World War II had just ended. Germany and Japan had been defeated. VJ Day, victory of Japan, had been proclaimed. I was only four years old, so I don't remember that vividly, but I did see some people cheering in the streets and confetti was pouring down and that he had come home from World War II from Italy with the Army Air Corps. And that was, those were the images that stay in my memory. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who is really our, uh, our mother, our catalyst for human rights, was the president's wife, first lady. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had died in 1944, and she was asked by President Harry Truman at the time to carry on and lead the human rights part of the United Nations and became one of our delegates there. And she helped us to engage the United Nations. The UN was actually born right down the road in San Francisco. And if you think about it geographically, Salem is really a small city between the two largest cities of Portland and San Francisco. And our name comes from the word peace, shalom, or shalom. And basically uh, today's talk is to try to make it real and uh, so fast forward, this October, we will have the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. There are about 193 members there. I see it as a, uh, a perfect opportunity to spread the gospel of community healing. Uh, this is important for three reasons, uh, all of which are really haunting us. Today, we have friction that is the result of the different forces evolving from the Black Lives Matter, number one, the pandemic, COVID, number two, and the Me Too movement of sexism, number three. We could also throw in the economy, which is a, a tributary to the pandemic. And all of those things are very divisive in our society. And I submit that United Nations Week could be number one proclaimed by the mayor. This is the easy part as a week of community healing. But specifically, I have three or four ideas I wanna share with the Human Rights Commission, of which I feel a very close kinship to. And the first would be a diversity panel, probably by Zoom. How would this come about? The diversity panel would have four or five of representatives from the major uh, and minor ethnic groups in town. Uh, we usually go to Mano a Mano, for the Latino, we would need to reach out to the uh, Russian Ukrainian group, uh, possibly to the uh, Marshallese group and uh, the Vietnamese, possibly the Filipino. I would ask the, the commission itself to uh, do the outreach to these groups and line up a panel so that each ethnicity could talk about some of the human rights abuses that have happened to them over the last decade and what progress has been made and where do we go from here, all in the spirit of healing. That's number one. Number two, and this would be a rather unique idea, uh, possibly having a melting pot cookbook with recipes submitted, maybe two or three from each ethnic group, and that could be used as a fundraiser and the funds raised could be going to the Human Rights Commission and from whatever money is saved, it could be put back into the, uh, the, the city's treasury so that other uh, priorities could be used and made up by whatever the cookbook brings in. Number three, cultural events. Uh, I thought long and hard about this and something in my Broadway musical heart veers towards South Pacific. Those of you who've seen South Pacific, there's a song it, it, about it, you have to be taught to hate and it has to do with a, a nurse, a Navy nurse from Kansas in a very sheltered climate of being introduced and falling in love with a plantation owner from France, escaped from France, and he had a wife who was black, uh, and he fell in love with her and had two children, but not until early in the game did uh, Nellie Forbush, the nurse, know about the that the children were 
a mixed race, and she had to struggle with how to deal with that because she was unused to people of mixed races. And it's really a very powerful play. It could be done possibly through the Pentacle or the Grand Theater or possibly the library could, could show a film on that. So I think that would be an excellent uh, pivot point to discuss what was like in the days of South Pacific and what it's like today and where do we go from here as a discussion following the Plato movie. And finally, since I am a gerontologist by profession, I'd like to propose that Center 50 Plus be involved and uh, they would have their own program, but off the cuff, my thoughts are that maybe it could be a salute to the different immigrant senior citizens from different cultures and each of them telling their story panel style or whatever about why they came to this country, what they found here, some of the hardships they endured at home and some of the assimilation that they did. So that's in a nutshell. I think I've made my 10 minutes (laughs) magically. So, so yeah, thank you. You right are about there. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so I could do a condensed version. There we go. Okay. My friends, I welcome your responses. Hello. Yes, thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions or reactions? Uh, This is Bella. I don't have any questions. Lee, thank you so much for, um, you know, providing feedback for what we, what we can do uh, for the community. I think, you know, I can speak, well, I'm not going to, but um, I think that we all really want to um, engage in a lot more outreach. Um, I know COVID is making it difficult and I know that our awareness committee and all of our various other committees are really, um, are still trying to find ways. So thank you so much for sharing some of your ideas. I hope that some of them could be implemented and just don't die in the wind. Thank you. Uh, Lee, this is Picarico. I know that there are a lot of community events happening already. Uh, maybe you've attended those. I would encourage you, if you're able to attend those or to contact the people organizing, Um, Because some of the stuff that you're talking about is kind of already happening. I know that there's a panel of Black, Indigenous, and people of color coming together to talk about community issues. I believe it's on Thursday. Um, And of course, they would welcome any other Black, Indigenous, or people of color, you know, especially if they're from Center 50 Plus, and Center 50 Plus wants to be a part of that. That would be great. There's also a Young Voices rally on the 26th that's happening, and I can forward... um, information on that for Gretchen to send to you. Tell me, tell me, tell me what is happening because I don't, I think it may be, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm not sure to what degree it has to do with human rights and uh, community healing per se. It might be more celebration of their ethnicity, but tell me what is being done in the various uh, ethnic communities in terms of human rights and uh, under the the rubric of the United Nations Charter, where where do we go from here? Because we are, our community is like a mini United Nations in a way. And I'm using that as a kind of a, a departure point. Sure, yeah. So I would encourage you to connect with the people that are doing that because I know that when a lot of the leaders are talking about anti-racism work, healing is front and center at doing that work. So I think it'd be very much in alignment with what you're looking at. Um, so I'd encourage you to connect with people because that way you could support them, they can support you. Um, and I think it'd be a great opportunity to learn about, you know, what, what people are wanting and needing and, and helping you with those ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not something that I could do single-handedly. And that's why I'm asking the uh, Human Rights Commission to come aboard and be the catalyst rather than just throwing it back in my lap. Right, so that's why I'm asking to encourage you to connect to these groups because they could help you with that. Um, and mm-hmm. we'd be happy to continue working with you on those events as well. Okay. Any other thoughts about how we could make these ideas go from something on paper or on 
cyberspace into reality because it's very easy to you know to come forth with ideas but it's a little more difficult i was the one behind the salem peace mosaic back in 2009 and also did three peace corps forums so i have done my share but i'm about to reach 79 in november and i'm slowing down a little bit and so i need a little help on the sidelines if i could be very forthright uh, this is Mike. I I will just add that uh, later on in our um, in our update on awareness task force, we'll talk about some um, uh, outreach ideas that we had um, uh, from our group, and uh, you, you would be welcome to um, participate with our group as well um, as we uh, come up with our awareness uh, strategies and tactics around it. Um, I it, you know. Um, I don't have a specific response to the specific ideas that you had tonight. I, I want to kind of um, uh, spend some time pondering it, as I'm sure the rest of the commissioners do. But um, I, I, I fully support uh, HRC, uh, the commission being more active and um, connected to our community organizations um, and supporting the uh, driving these issues up to the city. So. Uh, very supportive of uh, your name again. further exploration. Your name again is? Uh, this, is Mike. Name, uh, this is Mike. This is Mike Waters. Uh, and uh, okay, our awareness task force is now a formal uh, task force of the commission. And uh, Gretchen can share information about, about when we meet. And I will have an update later on tonight um, about some of the activities that we, uh, that we have planned. Okay, much appreciated. Thank you. Great. Any other comments or questions? I think we're at the time. Okay. Made my made my deadline, Cinderella style, before midnight. Thank you. Okay. Carry on. Thank you so much. And Krista, Krista has something to say as well. Hi, this is Krista here. I just wanted to add one last thing to Lee as well. Thank you so much for your time explaining the projects. Um, if you have any, if you want any more thoughts or questions on how to make those become more accessible for deaf people or people with disabilities, please contact me. I would be happy to give you some more information. And I know Gretchen can give you my contact information if you'd like more on that part. Okay. Yep. I admire your spunk and tenacity, by the way. I've seen you in action, Krista. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee, for joining us. Then we can move on to a bias crime update, and I believe that is uh, Lieutenant Aguilar. Yes. So I have quite a few to go over. Um, most of them are bias incidents, but there were a couple different bias crimes that happened. The first one happened on August 5th, and it was a road rage incident on I-5 between two female drivers, uh, began in Northeast Salem and uh, continued on I-5. Both drivers ended up uh, stopping in the South Salem area, getting out of their vehicles um, and having a confrontation, a verbal confrontation. The um, one of the drivers was Hispanic, the other driver was white. And during that confrontation, verbal confrontation, the white driver uh, made some disparaging comments towards the Hispanic driver um, in regards to her um, national origin, ethnicity. Um, ultimately, there, was, there were no criminal charges and it was um, not handled as a criminal matter, but uh, it was documented as a bias incident. Um, so the next day on August 6th, uh, Salem police received a report of graffiti that was spray painted on a fence that was adjoining the victim's rental condo. And the graffiti was a, uh, a Y and an N which the uh, victim identified as um, 
believing that was a uh, racial slur towards her and her uh, eth uh, her race is black. The victim also said that, uh, told the officer that she felt unwelcome in her neighborhood, that she had found a watermelon in her front yard in June of this year, and again felt that was a way to intimidate her, make her feel unwelcome. Um, she, uh, the officer ultimately worked with her on contacting her rental management company to let them know what was going on to clean up the graffiti. And there are no suspects in that incident, but if we do develop suspects, that would be charged as a biased crime uh, amongst other crime, uh, crime categories. On August 10th in Southeast Salem, we had a report of a male uh, holding a stick, yelling and screaming at customers who were coming in and out of a store. He was outside the store, uh, swinging the stick around, um, screaming a lot of different um, language, uh, a lot of different profanities, including including using some racial slurs towards customers. Um, the male was ultimately arrested on charges, but the officer did document it, uh, the incident as a bias incident. On August 10th, also on August 10th, in Northeast Salem, there was an argument between family members who have a history of not getting along. Um, the suspect family member during the argument that also included the suspect spitting on the victim used uh, anti-LGBTQ language towards the victim who is gay. Um, the suspect was ultimately charged with a crime and the officer documented that as a bias incident. On August 14th, there was, um, and I forgot to mark down where this was. I, I think it was Northeast Salem, but I'm, I'm not 100% positive. There was a, a domestic disturbance between a husband and a wife. Both are Hispanic. Um, however, during the incident that was both physical and verbal, the male suspect threatened to call ICE and have the victim deported because of her immigration status. And so there was um, there was both uh, domestic charges filed as well as the officer did file a biased crime uh, on the um, husband because of the, the national origin um, and the threat to call and have the victim deported if she called the police to report the crime. Um, so then on August 16th, this happened in central Salem, there was an argument between two unsheltered individuals over the suspect intentionally defecating on the sidewalk where the victim had been sleeping. Um, the victim actually caught the suspect doing this and reported it on a, a phone. The suspect became upset, took the victim's blanket and actually rubbed it in his feces. And then the police were called. Um, we responded, oh, and during the, the incident between the two, the suspect used racial slurs against the victim um, as part of that incident. So the suspect was um, arrested on charges and it was, uh, the officer documented this as a, a bias incident because of the racial slurs used. And then the last one, um, also, in, also in Central Salem, happened on August 17th. A female patron at a gas station uh, arrived in her car. A uh, male arrived in his car, a, a black male arrived in his car to get gas, both of them getting gas. 
the female accused the male um, of catcalling her friend or making some sexual comments towards her friend. Uh, the male denied the allegations. There were witnesses who said it didn't happen. The female followed the male into the store and then began to um, uh, verbally threaten to kill him and also called him racial slurs uh, prior to the male, uh, the female leaving the store. Uh, we were called and at that time the victim did not want to be the victim of a crime. So we took this as a biased incident and we don't have suspect information on the female. Um, however, if the victim, if we do identify the suspect and the victim does at some point want to be the victim of a crime, we would be able to charge it as a biased crime. So right now we have that one listed as a bias incident. And uh, that is the last that I have. I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Hey, this is Mike. I, I uh, thank you for that update. It seemed like more than usual. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you had any conversations with the officers around maybe if they had reasons why they might have seen more of that activity. Are they being more mindful to report? Is it is it a reporting issue or, is, or do you think that uh, because of the pandemic and the stressors that people are under that it might just be up? You know, I wish I knew the answer. Um, I do know that officers are becoming more educated on bias crimes and bias incidents, especially with the updated bias crime statute that came out that talks about the bias crime hotline. Uh, I sent out another training bulletin to talk them about what the differences are and the importance of documenting incidents as well as crimes. So some of it may be because the officers are um, are more aware. And so they're more apt to document these where in the past, they may document them, but they never make their way to me. Um, I would, I would like to think that maybe as a community, people are feeling more comfortable reporting to the police. I don't know if that's the case, or if it's just, there's an uptick because certainly, I think certainly there is, um, I think there is more stress in the community. We're seeing it where uh, people are losing their patients. People are exploding verbally. Um, I think we're certainly seeing that. So that may be a piece of this where um, we are seeing more people who are using that hate language um, or using it in combination, the hate language and the criminal activity um, so I, I wish I could say for sure what the reasoning is. It may be a combination of all of those. This is Bella, if I can say Thank something. You. Sure, yes. Um, Debbie, I want to thank you so much for bringing the reports um, to us. I know that this is a lot more than what we have seen, you know, in, in the past, I don't know, like year and a half that I've been with the commission. Yes. Um, and I think that there, there are many different factors, but I also think it's really valuable for us to hear what's actually happening in our community. So whether it's, you know, police officers um, training and documenting things better um, or people feeling more comfortable to report, um, I think that's valuable and thank you for the work that you're doing in helping officers get trained. Thank you. Bella. It's un yeah, it's unfortunate these th you know, we're hearing about these things and I think it's still valuable for the work that we're doing. Right, yes, absolutely. And that's uh, one of the big reasons why I'm reporting on these bias incidents, even though it does increase the time that we talk about this, that seems to be um, more prevalent in in Salem 
um, where we're seeing more of these um, racial, um, maybe even not criminal incidents, but we're seeing incidents with that bias attached. And um, it's important that the Human Rights Commission understand what's going on in the community, what people are experiencing, I guess. that was it um the other i wanted to if i i don't know can i talk about linnell's suggestion on the box uh not the box but the reporting on whether and shelters are okay so linnell i uh, as she was talking i was trying to think she had made a suggestion about the police department documenting um whether a unsheltered individual is, oh, there's Linnell, whether an unsheltered individual is a victim of a crime or a suspect of a crime. Um, and so how can we somehow track that? So as you were talking, my, my wheels were turning trying to figure out, um, I, think, I think there's definitely a way that we could do that with our report writing system, because really it would just be a checkbox. So I think it's doable. I think that my biggest question would be, how do we identify that person as being unsheltered? So is it, so when we, so I'd have to train the officers on what, how do we ask these folks? So if they're couch surfing, would that be considered unsheltered? If they're just living like on the streets in a camp, would that be what we would be documenting because it is kind of so transitional. Um, like maybe one day you're not in a home, but the next day you plan on going into a home. So to try to document it or track it as, um, as best as possible, that it might be worth us talking even offline about how, how would we go about doing that? Because I, I think it's possible uh, for sure just trying to figure out how we can do that. Yes, I'm at a meeting. I was calling. Um, um, Lee, I could ask you to right. mute your phone real quick. That would be great. And Linnell, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I didn't know if as a guest I'm allowed to respond, so I wanted to check. Um, I'm so grateful that this is even a consideration. And I, I think two thoughts come to mind. Um, when I was talking to Jimmy Jones and some other people who are more experienced in homelessness than I am, um, they're under the impression that sometimes police reports include the word transient as a descriptor. Mm -hmm. So that would be one area where it would count as a homeless person. But I think your points about, you know, couch surfing and other things, I think that if it's possible to move to some to a system that enables that kind of tracking about crimes done to and by individuals who are homeless, I would really want to get input from someone like Jimmy Jones so mm -hmm. that we're making sure that the definitions that we're using fit the statistics that ref that HUD or other definitions that are commonly used. So I don't feel qualified myself to speak to that, but I think that if if our departments might be willing to track it that way, getting definitions and advice about how to ask that question would be really crucial to have input from someone like Jimmy Jones. Yeah. But at least yeah. starting with, you know, when, when the word transient is used, that would be one of the times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll look into it and hopefully have something back by the next. That's awesome. The next meeting. And I think that also gives data for other things, like whether different laws are having the desired results and effect that we're hoping. But, you know, specifically about discrimination, I think it could really give valuable data there. So sure. thank you so yeah. much. Great, thank you. I think we can move on to uh, complaints slash concerns of, concerns of discrimination. Uh, uh, Griff. You bet. This is Gretchen. Thanks, everybody. I had um, two new situations reported to me this month, and then I'm also happy to answer questions if anybody um, had any regarding past situations. Um, Angela, one, you referred to me, a person um, was experiencing some difficulty with 
uh, an accommodation process. And as I dug into it, um, really disagreed with the policy or the requirement to file for the request and instead had very much wanted um, it to be kind of a policy change overall so that it wasn't a request process. Um, we talked it through, but I was unable to identify a way for that to happen. Um, um, so it was kind of an interesting conversation. In the other situation, um, a person just recently shared a photograph with me um, of a display in a um, at a home, at a private home in Salem. And the picture showed one thing that kind of looked to me like maybe a life-size cardboard cutout of a person that the, the sender described as blackface. It, it's a person that's a cardboard cutout that appears to be Black or African American and then holding a sign, I think that said BLM. And then there was also a cardboard cutout of kind of equal people size that appeared white that was holding a sign that um, I believe said all lives matter. And then they described that um, there's, I think that there's some community response in doing some chalking near the home and sharing their view of the person's display. So I received that information. Um, it creates a really interesting question, a, re a report like that for me, because I, I always think about what, what would the outcome be of any interventions that we consider, um, what, what kind of clarifying what is the goal of our work and looking for opportunities to really promote harmonious group relations to quote our code and what will help what will help and contribute toward that, um, you know, it's, it's just a fascinating question right now, I think overall. Um, but those are the two new reports that I received this month. And welcome questions if anybody had any. All right, thank you, Gretchen. It looks like nobody uh, has any questions on that topic. So I believe we can move on to accessibility of complaint process. Uh, I, I was one of the people who sent, yeah, sent emails to other organizations for feedback. I really didn't receive anything back. So I emailed them again just to say, hey, uh, you know, a reminder, you know, I really want your feedback on this. I still haven't received anything, so I was wondering if anybody else has any new information. We we did talk a little bit in awareness um, around you know that probably uh, accessibility is certainly a concern, but also just being aware of the resource, and so. Um, that's that's one thing that I think uh, um, uh, might make a difference is just people being aware of how to report. Yeah, I, I think that's important, you know, that people need to be aware that we're here and that we, you know, we have a reporting process. And then, Mike, have you guys thought about, and have you guys thought about, you know, a process of doing that, like of spreading the word that we're here and all that? Uh, yeah, I don't want to steal the thunder from my report later, though, <laughs> on awareness task force. But yeah, we have a couple of ideas. I think for this topic, nobody else has anything. So, I mean, I feel like we should go ahead to awardness, if that's okay. I mean, perfect timing, because I'm next on the agenda. Uh, so, 
uh, at the awareness uh, task force, uh, pardon me, I'm looking over here because I'm pulling up my notes. I uh, just make sure I have everything. Uh, the first thing that we talked about was the series of uh, videos that we would like to produce with CCTV. TV. Uh, we brainstormed a whole bunch of ideas at our awareness task force. And yesterday, Gretchen and I met with a representative from CCTV to uh, uh, discuss um, kind of the uh, what we might need to get going. Um, and we're working on some script material right now. Um, Gretchen has also been hard at work uh, working to find some uh, folks that Human Rights Commission has helped who could potentially provide uh, testimonials. So what we envisioned was a mix of videos, um, some that were testimonials, some that were more informational about the HRC being here, um, some that might feature uh, commissioners um, sharing, you know, hey, my name is uh, Mike and I'm a member of the commission and um, uh, we're available to take your, your questions and concerns, um, that sort of thing. So we're envisioning a series of videos. We haven't quite landed on a number um, or the exact topics of each video, but we're kind of uh, through the, in the process of scripting and, and finding resources to be spokespeople for those videos. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, the second thing that we talked about at awareness was um, improving our email outreach. Um, Gretchen has a few different lists uh, that she uses to share information about HRC. But the one thing that we haven't had up until now is actually a formal list of the partner organizations that we participate with. Um, we thought that by developing an email list, this might help us um, solve for some of the challenges we've had with uh, getting the liaison program up and running um, because we would have a more formal method of outreach to people. Um, we could still have um, aspects of the liaison program going. We can still have individual commissioners who can do outreach, but by having a formal email list, we would um, uh, be covering more of our bases to make sure that we're communicating with our partner organizations um, and other organizations that care about human rights. So, um, and then in talking about developing that, um, that email list of those partner organizations, that's where we kind of had our big idea, which is that we think it would be a really good idea to call together uh, leaders from those various organizations around Salem to some kind of Zoom meeting or Zoom conference where we would give them kind of the 101 on the Human Rights Commission who we are, what we do, what role we play, how we can help. Um, it would be an opportunity to gather feedback from them as well about ways that we could um, improve our awareness. Um, our, our task force really liked this idea a lot. We were interested to hear what Krista and Angelo thought in particular because we kind of thought you should lead it um, if we did such a meeting. So um, that was sort of our big idea of the awareness group this month and just wanted to get feedback from the commission about whether we think that's, that's a good direction to go. Uh, I have a comment, Krista says. That sounds wonderful, all the ideas that you've had so far. And I just love the idea of the Zoom meeting with the leaders of different organizations. I think that's a really great idea and I'm happy to support you for whatever you may need. Yeah, Angela here, I think that's a great idea and uh, I second that support. So just just let me know. Um, well, great, now that you know it's a good idea, I'll do the reveal that it was totally David's idea and not mine. <laughs> As the chair of the task force, I get to act like it was mine, but it was it was David. So thank you very much. Glad to hear it. Mike, this is Alex. I have a quick question. Um, what sort of organizations are we looking at? Are those all the organizations that we had on the list that Gretchen sent out? 
Yes, that would be the idea. Um, although I think anytime that you're doing something like this, it's always an opportunity to, to look at the list and make sure that it uh, includes everybody that you would want to include. So we may want to add organizations to that list um, as well as validate whether uh, those organizations are all still um, operating. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. This is Gretchen. I can go ahead and send it out just in case anybody has ads, deletions, updates. That would be excellent, Gretchen. Thank you. Any other questions for awareness? Um, of course, in our upcoming meetings, we will talk about the next version of the survey. Um, and uh, hope to have an update for you at, at one of the fall um, uh, HRC meetings as we start uh, talking with Marianne uh, about uh, completing that survey again. All right, I think that's it for awareness. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. And then uh, thank you, David, for the idea. I think it's, it's a great idea. And let's move on to core response. That is uh, myself. I haven't heard anything. So Gretchen, do you have anything or Bella? No, not at this time. I, I think it's time to go back to the drawing board and identify some potential um, next training opportunities. Angelo, I can, um, I can work with you on getting your ideas and Bella on that. All right, sounds good. It looks like I uh, have some work to do as well. So we can move on to Equity Lenses and Chapter 97, uh, Tricarico. Yeah, thank you. This is Tricarico. So um, we left that at, uh, I think Gretchen and Alex did some gathering of some equity lenses to look at. And then we all kind of took a look at some of the ones that were available and We'd like to have people who took on one of those tools to share a quick highlight of some of the things that they read when they were looking through those. Um, I realized now looking back that I looked at the wrong list based on the, uh, I was looking at first name, not last name. So I was looking at the others, but if anyone wants to chime in with what they learned about some of those tools or the things they liked about those tools, that would be super awesome. Or Gretchen, did you get any feedback from anyone? Do we need to push this to the next meeting maybe? Maybe we do. Um, I had one person reply regarding their availability for a meeting the week of September 14th for this small group. I don't know if you all would like to gather as kind of a informal group to discuss them or if you want to invite everybody to kind of read tools and report at the next full meeting. I, I just got one reply regarding schedule, but no, nothing about like highlights people liked or anything. Okay, um, so I guess the question would be, do you prefer having a small group meeting to discuss this further, or do we want to try to have highlights at the next large HRC meeting? This is Bella. Um, I apologize, I was not um, more active in a piece of, you know, our activities. Um, I would prefer to come back to the next meeting with highlights um, and also have the opportunity to participate in it if there's still an, um, space for me. Okay, thank you, Bella. This is Mike. Uh, uh, I also didn't uh, review my um, homework. Uh, but I would be interested in participating in a small group the week of 914 if one is scheduled um, 
uh, and then report back highlights at, at larger HRC. That would be, I think, my vote. Okay, uh, I really like this plan. I feel like it would be hard to not take up the whole meeting talking about these things. So Gretchen, can you please coordinate that small group meeting? And then can you also please remind us about, because I did it, but I did the long ones. So uh, can you remind us about who's doing what? And then um, let's try to make sure that we get on that and um, maybe have a few reminders. I know everybody's busy, so I really appreciate everybody being willing to have another meeting. I know we're in a lot of meetings right now um, to keep this going. And just remember that, you know, it's baby steps. If we decide that we're gonna eliminate half, that's still progress. And then we can regroup and look at the list again. So thank you for your willingness to do that. So I guess in a nutshell, my update is please call on us next meeting and we will have more information. <laughs>
Uh, the last item that we discussed at LGBTQIA plus uh, task force, intersectional task force. <laughs> See, even I get it wrong sometimes. I love it though. Uh, such a good name. Um, uh, is a transgender day of remembrance um, that is happening this year on a Friday, Friday, November 20th. Uh, our task force is interested in how we um, convert this to a virtual event because it will obviously have to be um, uh, at that time. Um, so we're endeavoring to uh, put together some of those details. Um, we would like to have uh, at least an advertisement for the event available by September 26th, because that's the Young Voices rally that Tracarico has mentioned um, and is an important outreach opportunity for us. So um, we're hoping to have some of the uh, event details, enough of them nailed down so that we can share a, a flyer or something at that event, um, which I will be tabling if anyone else ha has not uh, volunteered to table yet, yet, come join me. And I think that is everything for LGBTQIA plus intersectional. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, oh, I, I did forget things. I always forget things. Uh, uh, there were two items that we talked about toward the end of the meeting that uh, may be on our agendas in future. One is the concept of uh, queer uh, LGBTQIA uh, sort of center or space. Um, Tricarico is involved with some uh, folks that are, are working on that concept through the um, uh, the location, the building that we heard about last time at the broader HRC uh, meeting um, uh, on Medical Center Drive. Um, so that was uh, very exciting to hear that, that some of that is already in progress. The other concept that we discussed very briefly and I think will be a discussion at future LGBTQIA uh, intersectional meetings was the, um, uh, the concept of a safe spaces uh, uh, sort of um, uh, program, I, um, the word is, is slipping my mind as we get later in the evening, a, a program where businesses and organizations could designate themselves as a, a safe space um, and have some sort of pledge that they might sign and some sort of decal, decal that could go into their uh, window. Um, and what we talked about it at LGBTQIA is that this extends beyond our task force and, and could include um, uh, other groups in the pledge um, that businesses might take. So we're really interested in pursuing that concept as well. And just let, let me know if you have questions. All right, thanks everyone. Thank hey. you, Mike. Oh, oh. Go, go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I did I did have a question, Mike. Um, did you know that Seattle Police Department has a safe spaces program? Like it's exactly what you're talking about, where businesses uh, sign up and then they place a sign in their window. It was started by a, a police officer. He's, he's since retired, um, but it's, uh, so it, the op, uh, businesses sign up to put that in their window. And then it also encourages officers to visit those businesses to connect with not only those businesses, but that community. So I can get you a bunch of information uh, on it so we can, because I don't think they have it copyrighted. We could, I think I contacted him once and I think he said that we can use whatever we want. So I'll get you that information. That would be so completely awesome. Um, 
I have a little bit of experience with safe, safe, safe space programs on college campuses, but I have not seen a ton of examples of citywide safe state space programs. So Seattle has one. And if any of you hear of others, um, please, please pass them along. Thank you, Lieutenant Aguilar. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, we can move on to unsheltered neighbors, either Bella or Krista. Uh, this is Bella. I have not been um, <clears throat> able to attend any meetings, and so I'm going to just defer it to Gretchen or Krista if they have anything to share. This is a Krista. I don't really have much to add at the moment. Um, I do uh, just want to say I had a schedule conflict this uh, month, so I wasn't able to attend. But the next meeting, September 16th, I'm hoping to be able to attend that. Um, Gretchen, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add at this point. <laughs> It's now a, a pretty central part of my work to have the opportunity to, to work in this area and on this topic. But as it relates to our survey specifically, I think that was covered already under uh, Mike's report. And yeah, looking forward to attending the meeting with any commissioners that can to progress the survey. And I've not done, I owe everybody some legal research. We were contemplating the idea of um, adding to the list of identities or protected classes. And we've gathered some information from another city. Um, and I haven't had the opportunity to um, make progress on the legal analysis side, but that's, also, that's on our task list to try to study and understand. So more to come on that too. All right, thank you, uh, Gretchen and Krista. And then if we can move on to Youth Outreach. Uh, Nathan isn't here, but I'd like to hear more about the Young Voices event, if uh, you could do that, Tricarico. Yeah, Tricarico here. So the Young Voices Rally is something that's being put on by a couple of groups. So um, Equity by Design, which is ONI's group for um, anti-racism training classes, um, as well as the Surge chapter of Salem standing up for racial justice. It's a new thing, but there's nationwide chapters. Um, and there's a lot more people involved as well that I don't remember off the top of my head. The idea is to kind of gather different community groups together and talk about, okay, you know, how do we get involved with city politics and state politics and how do we make the changes that we want to see you know it's less of the you know rah rah protest type rally which those are very important too and more of the what are the specific actions that people can get involved in it's also very much aimed to be an educational opportunity um, because i think a lot of people especially young people are okay, well, how do I get involved? How do I make my voice heard? How do I make the changes that I wanna see happen? Um, we will also have speakers there, and I say we because I'm helping organize it, so that's why I can't help my table because I just won't be able to do both. Um, we'll have speakers there that will be talking about things as well. Um, so it's, I'm really grateful that Mike is gonna be there and I'd love to have more people there you know, who are comfortable. I know events are challenging, um, we are going to have it outdoors, so there'll be space for social distancing, and um, I do believe we have masks, and you know that's something that we have encouraged every event that I've been to um, with the same people is we really encourage the social distancing, the mask, hand sanitizer. You know, we have more hand sanitizer and masks than we know what to do with. Um, so I think it'd be not only a great opportunity for the HRC to do some outreach to the youth specifically, 
but also to get people involved, get people coming to our meetings, you know, um, because I think a lot of people come to us and they don't really understand the process maybe or, or how to get their ideas heard. And I'd love to share that and be able to talk about that. There's also going to be a crew kind of filming each of the booths so that we can upload this as a resource later. So people who aren't able to attend that day or don't feel comfortable can access it in a virtual environment as well. Oh, and I should say the date again. So it's September. 26, I believe it's scheduled 12 to 3, and it's at the Medical Center Drive location. Um, Wade Harris, who came and talked to us about his place, he's offering that um, to be used as well. So it's going to be in the parking lot there, and I can share the flyer with Gretchen as well. Oh, and please let me know if you have questions. All right, thank you, Chair Carico. I will uh, be, I will try to be involved with this event because I think that's one of my greatest, you know, I, I one of my missions is to get more youth involved because, you know, as a youth myself, I see that not many youth are involved and I think it's really important because they are the future. And so I think this will be a great event. I think we can move on to a staff update, Gretchen. Yeah, I can share. I, I think I've got just one tonight and that is that, um, those of you who are aware, we're um, moving forward with a performance audit of the um, police department. And um, from our Human Rights Commission, Wilma Oni Marchbanks has agreed to serve as a member of the team. Um, there's, there's a group that's formed as kind of a steering committee or a group to be a resource um, to the auditor as they move through their process. So I just wanted to thank Wilma for um, her work on that. And I believe both myself and Lieutenant Aguilar are on the staff team to assist the process from a staff end. But other than that, I don't have any um, staff updates tonight. Thank you. How about a community calendar? You know, I don't, I've been not, really building the document lately. I, I guess I have found less and yet there are a lot going on. I think I'm just becoming less and less capable of pulling that document together. So I, I know we've talked about a couple of events this evening, but I don't know if anybody has any others to add. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll take that as a uh, no, nobody else has any events. So we, we can uh, go ahead and go to- uh, Hey, uh, Angelo, oh, Angelo, yeah. this, is, this is Mike. I, uh, I apologize, I was trying to look this up. There is a uh, Capital Pride happening on October 11th. Um, there are not um, a ton of details. Um, it's looking like it's going to happen October 11th, which is a Sunday from 9 to 11 uh, in the morning. And uh, information about it is available on Facebook. It's an all virtual event. Thank you, Mike. And then all right, remember remarks and announcements. Anybody has anything to say? This is uh, your chance, your opportunity.
Anybody? All right, we are a little early, but if it's okay with everybody, I think we can uh, call this meeting and this meeting is adjourned.